Okay, I think we are at the uh, at the eleven forty five mark right now. So a few people, I'm sure, will come and join us uh, as we get going along here. But I think I'll just start off with the session today. So uh, hello, everyone who's come and uh, joined me in this session today. Thank you for joining me. My name is Ken. I'm the Digital Media Literacy Project Manager at Civics. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that is, about what this uh, project is, and about Control F, Find the Facts. This is a contemporary digital media literacy skills program for informed citizenship. So if you haven't heard of Civics, where I uh, am coming to you from today, uh, we're a Canadian education charity dedicated to building the habits and skills of citizenship among youth. Uh, we've been doing this for the last two decades, creating experiential learning programs and curriculum materials for teachers to use with their students. Uh, we run a range of programs, but people are usually most familiar, familiar with us from our student votes program, it's our flagship program, which is a parallel election for students under the voting age that takes place in schools at election time. Uh, Control F, which I'm going to be talking about today, is one of our newest programs. Its focus is digital media literacy and verification skills that help students to contextualize and evaluate online information. Okay, so to give you a sense of what the problem that we want to focus on is, uh, here is a collection of headlines that I collected uh, this morning, actually, just to try to keep things as up to date as possible, even though a few of these, these uh, headlines are, are a few months old. But this is uh, representative of a problem that I'm sure you're all familiar with, which is that there is a tremendous amount of false and misleading information out there online about a whole range of topics. I chose these topics today because I know I'm talking to geography teachers and I know we've been talking a lot about climate change in the sessions today, which we, which we should be. And you've probably come across a lot of this disinformation and misinformation about climate change online. Uh, this is a big problem, the amount of misinformation and disinformation that's out there. It has serious implications for how our democracy functions. And to help address these problems, these problems of online misinformation and disinformation, we created Control F. This is, again, as I mentioned, our digital media literacy verification skills program that helps students contextualize and evaluate online information. And really, our, our sort of purpose here is that we think that for democracies to work, citizens need to be informed and engaged. And Control F is really built around this fundamental question of informed citizenship. How do we as citizens navigate our polluted online information environment to find the trustworthy information that's out there? Now, I say that the online environment is polluted because there, there is good stuff out there, right? Like there's good information out there. It's just mixed in with a lot of garbage. So we have to be able to find the good stuff among all the not so good stuff. And this is not always easy, right? Um, we all struggle with this uh, and we all need skills to get better at this. And we think that this is something that students should start to learn at a young age and in school. Uh, the Control F program itself is named for the keyboard shortcut for find. Uh, it's a PC centric shortcut if you're a Mac person, might be Command F, but Control F is our keyboard shortcut for find, at least for me. Uh, and like that shortcut, Control F is based on the idea that there are simple steps anyone can take to online to understand online information. So today, this is really what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a tour of the Control F program. I'm going to walk you through some of the materials that we have. I'm going to get your, uh, get your help identifying some online misinformation, I hope. And then I'm going to tell you about some of the research that we've done uh, to show that this stuff is, is useful and effective in classrooms. OK. To get us started, uh, a little warm up, something relatively light. Uh, here are two screenshots from Twitter accounts, which purports to be showing new products created by KFC, everyone's favorite or maybe least favorite fried chicken company. On the left, this Twitter account says that uh, they have developed uh, an extra crispy sunscreen which features uh, a hunger-inducing scent. And on the right, this Twitter account says that KFC has developed uh, a video game console that has a built-in chicken warmer. OK. Now, here's what I want you to do. Uh, I am going to try to give you a poll. Uh, yes. OK. There should be a poll 
that you should be able to see now where I'm asking you for your input about these examples. Take a look at these, exam uh, these screenshots here. Uh, if you want, I have the URLs under there. If you feel like you want to type that out and copy it, you probably don't. But take a look at these right now and tell me, what do, you, what do your instincts tell you? Do you feel like these are real things, fake things? Do you think that one of them seems real, one of them seems fake? We know online that there's a whole lot of stuff that's made up and people just sort of post things for people to try to you know, get clicks and interactions. But we also know that it's a strange world out there, and maybe these products could actually exist. So let me know in the poll, which one do you think? Do you think these are real, or do you think these are fake? I do hope that poll is working. If you don't see it, also feel free to pop in the chat. Uh, or the or the Q&A or wherever you want to pop that in. Give me a sense of whether you think that these things are maybe real or fake. Thank you, Marianne. <laughs> this is my first time to pop in. I can't be sure whether these things are actually working or not. So take a second there. Uh, tell me what you think. Are these real? Are these fake? Which ones? Some of them are real. Maybe some of them are fake. OK, uh, I am going to, I think, show the results if everyone's had a chance to take a look there. OK, great. Um, so uh, most of the vast majority, if you can see those results, uh, then, then this will just be old news to you. But the vast majority of you said that they were both fake. Uh, one of you said that the sunscreen was real and the video game was fake. OK. so. Uh, the big reveal, which ones were real, which ones were fake. The sunscreen, extra crispy sunscreen with the hunger-inducing scent, that one is real. That one is a real product that KFC uh, actually developed. Um, the video game console, on the other hand, of course, is also real. It's a real product that KFC invented. It has a built-in chicken warming tray. These are real products. OK, this is a silly example, and it probably doesn't matter much in the long term, long term for humanity of whether these are real or fake products, right? But the point is, is that our plausibility filters can often fail us, right? We see something we see online and we sort of immediately instinctually think, well, that can't be right, that that got to be fake, right? And we can imagine people using their critical thinking skills to try to logic out whether these images are likely to be real or likely to be fake, right? So you might take a close look at this picture on the left, and you might think that looks Photoshopped. Or on the picture on the right, and you might think that just looks like a 3D model. That's not real, right? Um, this kind of critical thinking is important when evaluating information online, but it's not the best thing to do first, right? The best thing we want to do first when we're evaluating information online is to get off the page, do a little research, and find out for sure whether what we're looking at is real or fake. Where we get our information from really, really does matter. And to sort of drive this on, I'm going to play a three-minute video for you from one of our key collaborators, Mike Caulfield. He's a digital literacy expert who works at the University of Washington Center for an Informed Republic. And he sums up the importance of finding context really well. Now, I think I'm going to share this in a, uh, well, actually, let's try this and see if our volume works. So I'm going to tell you a story, uh, calling it the parable of weight. That sounds entirely self-important, but but trust me, uh, there is uh, there is a there is a point to this. So let's imagine someone. Let's call her Jill. Apologies to anybody whose name is Jill. Jill is walking along a beach or jogging. She sees uh, in the lake. She sees a bottle. In the bottle, there's a note. So she runs out into the waves. I don't know why. She runs out into the waves. She pulls out that note, and the note says N95 mask. Don't stop. COVID, right? They don't stop COVID-19. And she's no dummy. So she starts to she starts to examine this document and she sees it's written by an NMD. They're from the University of Upper Ohio. Uh, there's lots of footnotes uh, in, in the uh, article. And there's data, there's data, lots of numbers, uh, lots of evidence uh, in this uh, in this document. And she also applies uh, critical thinking in terms of looking for logical fallacies, trying to follow the argument. And the argument here is pretty rock solid. It says, 
that the mask weave of an N95 mask is 0.3 microns, coronavirus is 0.1 microns, which means that the coronavirus is going to sail through that N95 mask like a marble through a chain link fence, right? I mean, you can just do the math, right? So she runs to her friend, Greg, and she says, hey, uh, Greg, I got, I got bad news. N95 masks don't work against COVID. Um, the weave is too loose uh, and the, the virus is too small and we've all been lied to. And Greg says, uh, that's shocking. Where did you find this out? And Jill says, uh, well, I, I, I found it uh, on a note, you know, in a bottle floating in a lake. Okay, okay, so it's great, but how, if that's the case, how do you know whether this is trustworthy? Jill says, I, you know, I'm no dummy. I, 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 use the, uh, I use the power of critical thinking. So I, I went and I looked and I, I saw, like, who wrote this? And they, they're an NMD, right? I looked at all the footnotes, right? And there's, ton of, there's a ton of footnotes, which, which is very authoritative. There's data in it. There's numbers. There's charts. And uh, I ultimately followed the train of the argument. I followed, I followed the argument, and, and it looks like the argument makes sense. You can sort of just do the math here yourself. Greg says, all of this is fine, but there's a, there's a problem, right? You, you, you jumped into critical thinking, which is, which is something, which great, is something that you want to do, but it's really the second step, right? Before you engage in critical thinking, what you have to do is you have to gather critical context. Okay. Uh, yeah, great. So this is summed up really well in Mike's video. Uh, in, when we find information online, instead of stopping to ask who wrote this, where did it come from, what do other people say about it, we tend to read closely before we even really know what it is that we're looking at. And these kind of traditional cr critical thinking skills that Mike was talking about, these are still very important, but there's an order of operations here, like he mentioned. Before we start analyzing something, we need to gain context, right? We also want to make sure that we're using the right tools to get this context so students know which information is credible. And the best way to find context for information online is by reading laterally. So lateral reading simply refers to the act of leaving a page information is on to investigate the source or claim rather than looking for clues within the claim itself. If you think about those tabs that you might have open in your browser, sort of moving to the side, right? That's the lateral reading motion there, getting off the page, going somewhere else to find some context. When most people try to assess information, they read vertically. So again, if we think about a page sort of scrolling up and down, you're sort of staying on the page being vertical and applying close reading skills. So analyzing the content really closely to see if it seems credible. So some of the things we hear about sometimes is people look at the about page of a website. They check to see whether a URL is a .org or a .com. They look for typos, look for the, there's ads on the page and things like that. And these kind of close reading strategies, they're frequently packaged in checklists for students. You may have heard of the CRAP test. CRAP is an acronym, currency, relevancy, I forget what the other letters stand for. But we know that these strategies too often fail students when they are applied to online information. So lateral reading is really what Control F is all about. And it's a, sort of a better way of finding uh, whether your information is, is reliable uh, because it turns to other sources outside of the, of the text that you're reading. In the context of the Control F program, we have three lateral reading skills that we teach, investigate the source, check the claim, and trace the information. These strategies are packaged into classroom activities. Uh, they're grounded by those kinds of videos that you saw uh, that Mike gave there and give uh, hands-on practice to students to evaluate information from both reliable and real unreliable sources. So let's dive right into things. Here's how the Control F program starts. On the way to the, introducing these three skills, our first lesson is why verify. And this lesson provides an overview of the problem of information pollution that I talked about briefly a few slides ago, gives students uh, some familiarity with the distinction between misinformation and disinformation. So misinformation, false information, that's not necessarily intended uh, to mislead. Disinformation, that false information that is intended to mislead. A uh, lateral versus reading, vertical reading is also introduced and students complete activities that help them recognize the limits of their existing source evaluation skills, maybe with some KFC examples as well. Uh, and then we get into some of our lateral reading skills. 
Our first strategy and our first lesson here is investigate the source. Um, the acti educational activities in this section explore the different kinds of people and groups that produce content, as well as their motives for doing so. And here students start to practice lateral reading skills by using the internet to research sources and learn about their reputations. And the fundamental skill for this section is to look up unknown sources on Wikipedia. Okay, so some of you will maybe have just balked at the thing that I just said when I talked about Wikipedia, because we're often, or I mean, many people still are, taught that Wikipedia is not a place you should go to do research, that it's unreliable, that anyone can edit it, that it's just sort of a is sort of an unregulated wild west of, of collaborative knowledge production, right? Okay, so that may have been true many years ago in its uh, initial development, but in the year 2022, Wikipedia is a tremendous source of information about what kinds of sources are reliable on the internet. It's not to say that it is the be all and end all. We're not suggesting that you start and finish all of your research on Wikipedia, but it is a fantastic starting point. And it really does help students uh, locate information about unknown sources. And really, actually, this is uh, we've when talking to our researchers and our collaborators found out that this is what professional fact checkers do. Whenever they come across a source they do not recognize, step number one, they go to Wikipedia to see what it says. So this is a quick and easy way to get your bearings about the reliability of a source. And I've got an example uh, on here on your screen. Uh, this is something that uh, I came across from a website called Natural News. Okay, and I'm not familiar with this website. I, I don't really know it, I just sort of saw this story. And I read this story and it seems, it seems quite shocking. It says that the Canadian government uh, spends $8.5 million on insect production facility to force people to eat bugs. So uh, this is in my interest because I don't wanna be forced to eat bugs. This is a scary headline. Is this something that I should believe? Is this a source that I should trust? Well, I, again, I don't know this source, right? So I'm not exactly sure whether I should trust this information. So what we do and what we tell our students to do is we wanna look up this information on Wikipedia. So I'm just gonna to go to the tab there. She should be able to see. So this is the source, uh, this is the site itself. And you can see that there is the, uh, the article here. Uh, now, there are some things on here that make me a little bit skeptical right away. There's some sort of weird ads, and uh, I don't know. I don't know if I like the look of this, right? But of course, I don't want to rely just on that kind of instinct. I want to actually do some research to find out. One thing that I can do to look up this source really quickly and easily is to do what we call the Wikipedia trick, and that's just to take our URL at the top here. I'm going to then take off everything that follows the .com. I'm just going to take that off. And then I'm going to type the word Wikipedia. And there's no trick to this. This is just a thing that gets the Wikipedia entry to the very top of your search engine results. And here's what I find. I find the Wikipedia article right there. And I can see just in the first sentence that it is a uh, anti-vax conspiracy theory and fake news website known for promoting pseudoscience, disinformation, and extremism. OK, so I've done a quick check of this source that I was unfamiliar with. And immediately I can see this is not a source that I want to rely on for probably much information at all. Now, I don't have to take the first sentence's word for it, right? The nice thing about Wikipedia is that there are all of these references at the bottom here. If I want to do a little bit of a deep dive, I can. I think I have enough information that I can move on from this. But we can see some of the reputable sources that uh, Wikipedia references in the bottom here, things from the Atlantic, from the Weather Channel, sources that we know are good sources of information. There's also another thing uh, we can do. This is a new feature, a relatively new feature of uh, Google, which is that if I want to do a quick uh, check of a source that I don't recognize, I can just do a search for that check. It'll come up here. You'll see that the, uh, the URL of the website is our first result here. You'll also see that there's these three dots here. And this is a relatively new thing. You can click on that, and that just pops up uh, a little summary of uh, this, in this case, the Wikipedia article on this site. And here again, we get the same information that lets me know that this is really not a good place for me to go for information. So that's just a nice little trick uh, that you can use as well. Okay, 
So this is one of our, our key, uh, really key strategies in our investigate the source uh, lesson as the first part of control app here. Um, I wanna give you a chance uh, to take a look at this as well, to try to investigate a source, uh, if you will indulge me. So here is a little bit more of a complicated example. Here is something that I came up to say that I came across on my Instagram feed. And it's a, it's a graphic uh, that says that, look, you can care about the environment, but you don't have to worry about getting hysterical, <laughs> put that in quotes, uh, you don't have to get hysterical about climate change, right? We can sort of just calm down about it. And I don't know this source. Uh, it's called PragerU. That's the name of the, of the uh, account there. I don't know that source, and so I don't really know if this is reliable. I can't do my Wikipedia trick here because this is an Instagram, uh, this is an Instagram page. I will actually just post the link in the chat if you'd like to go and visit that. You can check that out for yourself. Um, but I can do a search. I can try to look up this source on Wikipedia. So this is what I want you to try to do, uh, is to look up this source on Wikipedia. Tell me, do you think that this is a good source of information about climate change? What did you find if you looked up this source on Wikipedia? And I'm going to give you a minute uh, just to do that. Uh, if you will indulge me and... Uh, do some lateral reading with me and take a look at the source, see what you can find. I'm actually gonna publish a little poll as well uh, that you can answer uh, once you've got some, uh, once you've got your answers there, once I give you a minute to take a look. Just a few options there. If it looks to be a good source, it doesn't look to be a good source, or maybe it's something that right now you're unsure about or you can't tell. I'm just gonna give you just another minute. Unfortunately, I cannot see the results of the polls as they come in, so I sort of have to just guess when you're done. So I'm gonna give you about 30 more seconds, and then I will anticipate that you will have submitted your answer by that time. Okay, I'm gonna take a look at those results, see what happened. Okay, great. So I do apologize if I cut you off, like I mentioned. Unfortunately, I can't see the results come in. So I sort of had to guess. We had all, most of you, 75% uh, of you said it does not look to be a good source. One said that I'm sure can't tell, maybe didn't give you enough time with that. If you do check out the Wikipedia entry for Brigger, you, you will note, you will see here that uh, as Wikipedia says, Despite the name, it's not an academic institution, doesn't hold classes, is not recognized by any body, by any recognized body, is frequently criticized for presenting misleading or factually incorrect content, especially as it pertains to climate change and the pandemic, right? So this is not a very good source of climate change information. Again, if we just, we're not sort of making any judgments about what we should do about climate change, given this information, we're just sort of evaluating the source. And if we want to find good information on climate change, we now know that this is not the place to do it, right? We also see that it says it's an advocacy group, right? We're actually going to talk about that in a second, because these are not the kinds of groups that we're going to want to look for. Okay, thank you so much for playing along with me. Uh, I'm going to get you, you're going to do a few more things for me today, actually. You're going to do some more lateral reading for me, but I promise that it will be, that it will be fun. Okay, so uh, here I think we, we can go back to Mike's point in the video about the importance of establishing critical context before doing critical thinking, right? Critical thinking is still important. It, it absolutely is. But we can only really start doing it once we've established the context, once we know that the information is coming from a, a reputable source, from a reliable source. There's not really any point 
in doing a lot of deep thinking about something that's coming from a source that is known for spreading misinformation. We're much better looking somewhere else if we're going to look for that kind of information. And here's a quick thing that I just want to return to. This is something uh, that the Control of Resources address uh, as well in, in our program. Uh, and this is the difference between bias and agenda in sources. And when we're looking at news sources in particular, students are often quick to look for signs of bias, so political bias specifically. And it's not wrong to do so, right? Many media organizations are aligned with a certain part of the political spectrum or catered to readers with certain values. But we want to emphasize for our purposes here these quick context checks, right? This kind of bias really doesn't matter at this point, right? What we're really concerned about is agenda, namely what a source of information is set out to do. So if you read a news article that's on the more conservative-leaning National Post or the more left-leaning Toronto Star, you can still be confident that the facts that are being reported in those sources are more or less accurate. Because regardless of the editorial positions, right, they're both professional news organizations that have standards, they pay reporters to produce information, they have processes of fact-checking and correcting mistakes, right? So you might not agree with the opinion pieces of one of these pieces, one of these sources or the other, but if it's a news piece, you can be confident that those facts are pretty accurate as presented. This is not the case when it comes to organizations that have agendas, right? So PragerU, the one that you just checked for me, seems to come comes off as like a university, as something that is meant to inform and, and enlighten, uh, but it is actually something that just is trying to push a certain kind of agenda with certain kinds of values. It's not actually meant to try to inform, and that's what we want students to recognize. Avoid those kinds of sources. Okay, our next strategy, that was strategy one. The next two strategies will go a little bit quicker. Our next strategy is checking the claim, and this one is really helpful when we come across some information online, but the source is one that doesn't have a Wikipedia page, or it's just something that you come across that is posted on social media, right? So say I, I read a claim that my uncle made on Facebook, right? My uncle does not have a Wikipedia page. I cannot look him up. Uh, so I, all I have to go on is the claim itself. And in this section, we look at different types of claims and we're gonna practice verifying them by doing keyword searches. What we wanna know is whether the claim is being reported by other sources and whether it's been fact checked, right? So we know that if we can find the same story that's being reported in other sources, uh, reputable news organizations or fact-checking organizations. You see some on your screen here. PolitiFact, Snopes is a very popular one, right? This is where we wanna find out, uh, is this information being reported by others, fact-checked? If it is, then we can make a better evaluation of whether we should accept it. Okay, to give you an example of a, a claim that you might come across, here is a claim that I came across recently, uh, a TikTok video. I am trying to be cool and understand the kids and go on the TikToks. It's been a struggle, but I came across this uh, on TikTok. Uh, it was a video of a humpback whale, according to the uh, description, swallowing two girls in California. And you can see the video is playing there for you there. Don't worry, there's no sound, we don't need it. Uh, this is the claim that is made, uh, being made in this video. And then the live end of the video is not as good. There's the, just show you that one more time. There's the kayakers being swallowed by a whale. Okay, dramatic stuff, right? Uh, this is something that went viral. Uh, this is something that seems very, uh, very surprising. Okay. Um, is it true, right? I, I can't do a Wikipedia search on TikTok. That's not going to do me any good. I can't do a Wikipedia search on whoever this is. I don't think they're that important, right? No offense to this person. Uh, but I can try to look for the claim. And what I want to do is do a keyword search to find out uh, is this actually true? Are other organizations reporting this information? So doing a keyword search can be sometimes be a little bit of an art. You're not always going to get the right keywords at the right time. If it is just sort of a short claim, you can often just sort of copy the entirety of the claim, paste it, and see if it comes up anywhere. In this case, I'm going to look at the description of the video. So I'm going to see humpback whale swallowing two girls in California. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that, and I'm going to see has anyone else reported 
on this information. Okay, so this is just my easy sort of quick keyword search to do this. Other keyword searches might work. You can do maybe just humpback whales, swallows, kayakers, or something like that. That might also work. Uh, but what we see that came up first here is an article from Snopes. Uh, and so we know Snopes, reliable fact-checking source. Is the humpback whale swallows two girls in California real? It's miscaptioned. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, according to this source, the video is not fake. It's not sort of like a, there's no computer graphics. There's no sort of trickery or whatever like that. This is a, a real video, but it's miscaptioned because the girls in the kayak were actually sort of behind the whale, not in the whale's mouth. So it's sort of a trick of the angle there. And we can see actually that Snopes is being extremely thorough. They actually have alternate angles of the same event that happened to show that this is not something that was real. Uh, Snopes is great because it does, you can see it does all the sort of, uh, all the sort of deep dive investigation and it has all of our sources here. So we can know that this is not in fact the case. And this is really what we wanna do with our check the claim, right? Find a claim, do the keyword searches, see if it's being reported anywhere else. And then uh, if we can find it, in this case we did in a reliable fact checking source, that can tell us this is not really uh, a claim that we should we should accept. Although it is, you know, it is an exciting, exciting video. What, what more is TikTok for? Okay, our last strategy is uh, called trace the information. This is strategy number three. We call this one kind of the broken telephone skill uh, because we know that online information, pictures, videos, whatever, they get shared, they get reshared, they get taken out of context, they get distorted, right? So what we wanna do is when we come across some information, we want to try to trace it back to its original source or as close as we can get to the original source to see if that information really is accurate or if there's been some changes as it's been shared, right? Uh, so that we have a number of skills that we uh, that we teach in this section. We're not gonna go through all of these today, don't worry. But there's some skills, uh, I'll just mention them here. Click through, uh, click through is when you have an article that mentions you know, as reported in such and such and then links to that. We wanna make sure that the, art, the article that is reporting it is being faithful to the thing that they're citing. So we wanna click through to the original article. We do a find, so that's just control F for information on a page. Checking the dates to make sure that information is actually from what it says that it's from. Uh, and doing a reverse image search. So uh, looking up an image to see if it has been distorted uh, in the, uh, maybe it's been manipulated or something like that. Okay. Um, here is uh, an example. This is actually an example from our materials uh, that we give to our students. Uh, it's a trace the information example. Uh, and it's a quote that is attributed here to Justin Trudeau that says, I don't read the newspapers. I don't watch the news. I figure if something important happens, someone will tell me. And then sort of that's sort of a very dire quote that's accompanied by this, this nice little cursive Justin Trudeau, right? And it's attributed here to, to AZ quotes, right? I don't know what that is. That, that's just, that seems to be one of these sort of tools you can use online to match a picture with a quote to make something meme-ish that looks like this sort of thing right here, right? Uh, this post is something that maybe you've come across this before. It tends to circulate a lot during elections for people who are not super fans of the Liberal Party or Justin Trudeau. Uh, and so this is something that we want students to try to do, to try to trace this information. Can you find out where this quote came from? And this is something that I want you to do. This is the last thing I'm going to ask you to do for me. I do believe that's the case. The last thing that I'm going to ask you to do for me is to try to find, is this, where did this quote come from? It didn't come from AZ quotes. That's not a thing, right? It came from somewhere. So trace this information. Something you can do is you can do a search for part of the quote or the entirety of the quote and see if you can find out where did it come from and is there anything else that we should know about it uh, when you find it. Maybe it was not actually, maybe Justin Trudeau never said it. Uh, maybe he did. Maybe it was taken out of context. Can you find out where this maybe came from and any sort of information you can find about it? I'm going to give you a few minutes for that. I'm going to ask you to put that uh, in the chat if you can, to give me sort of any information that you can find out about this quote.
So this is a little bit of a long one. It might take a minute here. I'm going to give you a couple more. Just going to give you a couple more minutes. Do a search. Hopefully, you're able to do a search. If you're joining me from a smartphone or something, maybe sitting on a beach and you can't do the search, then that's OK. But if you're sitting in front of a laptop computer like I am, uh, then just open a new window, do a little search, see if you can find out some information about this quote. Where did it come from? Did Justin Trudeau actually say it? Is there any more context there? Tell me there in our chat. I won't make you do a poll this time. OK, Kimberly's got a pa uh, pasted a URL of, of, uh, of what they found there. That's very helpful. OK, so found this article here. Any information that uh, you can tell me about that? He did say it in the context of his own campaign. OK, uh, Tom has got a Globe and Mail article there. Any other information that you can find that we might so it seems like so far, it seems like he did say it. Um, so this is not something made up. This is not one of those those fake quotes all, always attributed to Einstein or whoever, right? This is something that's that's real. Marianne's still reading. Thank you, Marianne. It's a long article, I understand. Uh, Tom says that he says, uh, he said at age 29, Kimberly notes, McLean's original source is best as, as they can see. OK, great. Doing some skimming, absolutely. <laughs> we appreciate it very much. I'll give you just a few more seconds if you want to see if you can find some more information about that. Does seem like it did happen. See if we can find any more context that we can better sort of understand this quote. Okay, I think that. Uh, Tom has maybe hit the nail on the head here, which is that he said it at age 29, right? So here is, I apologize for cutting you off as well. Uh, we'll uh, go through this just in, in a minute here. Uh, here's what I did when I was searching for this, and this is probably what you did as well. So I sort of Googled the first half of the quote to see what came up. Uh, I found a number of sources, right? Uh, one of them that I found was the Globe and Mail, and I see that uh, Tom found the Globe and Mail as well. Maybe some of you did as well. Uh, and for me, unfortunately, it was paywalled. I, I, I don't have a subscription to the Globe and Mail. I should be supporting Canadian journalism more, but I am just not at this time. So I couldn't read it there. I did find this McLean's article as well, which a number of you also found uh, found there. Uh, and this is what I found, uh, found this article. I think this is the same article that uh, Kimberly pasted in the chat. Appreciate that. Uh, and uh, so here I find this information here. Now, as I think Marianne is noticing, uh, it's an ex it's extremely long. There's so much stuff here, right? So this came up in my search, but my God, I'm not going to spend all the time reading that. So something that I can do is to do a little search in my page. And this is where Control F, the name for which the program is named, comes in handy. I do a little search, and I can start looking for I don't read the newspapers. And immediately, this is sort of what comes up don't read the newspapers, I don't watch the news. I figure if something important happens, someone will tell me, it takes me right there, right? Okay, great. So I know that it's true. Uh, this is a reputable source. I see other sources are reporting on it as well. Uh, I know he said it. Uh, the key context here, the information, and I think this is what Tom was pointing out, is that he said it 20 years ago, right? So is this a good thing for someone to say at any point in their lives? Probably not. Right, but it's not nearly as damning uh, if he were to have said it while he was currently prime minister. Right, that would be terrible. So this information is still not great. It doesn't make him look good, but it's not as bad as it might be presented when it's presented out of context, say in the last couple of years or with a uh, more contemporary picture that you see uh, that you might see on here. Right. Okay. Thank you so much for indulging me and for doing that lateral reading. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, just to give you uh, just to give you a little bit of behind the scenes, I mentioned that this is an example that we use in the Control F program with students. Uh, so this is an example of a Google form that guides students through the investigation. Uh, basically the same thing that you did right now, but just sort of broken up into a few other uh, steps. 
and uh, with, there's lots of other examples like this as well. Okay, uh, I'm gonna move into the, the last 10 minutes I have. I do wanna spend, uh, save some time at the end for Q&A if there are questions. Uh, so I'll give you a few minutes at the end for that. Uh, but just sort of the last part thing of the of the, my presentation here today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the research and the uh, sort of the sort of behind the scenes of the program itself. So uh, just to let you know about Control F, just a few few things here. This is our URL, uh, just right there. You can go to controlf.ca at any time. Uh, it is free with registration. Everything on the site is free. Uh, it's uh, aimed at grades seven to twelve. We are working on an elementary adaptation as well takes about seven hours of class time, uh, involves lesson plans, slide decks, and assessments, comes in multiple formats, Google and Microsoft Forms. Uh, teachers have told us they found it really flexible. They use it in person. They can use it for remote teaching, if that's something that you're still doing. And all of our materials are in both English and French. Uh, there's a lot of expert-led videos on there, like the one you saw earlier from Mike, and this is from our other collaborator, Jane, who we were actually talking to in a different presentation about Control F yesterday. We, you joined by her, which was lovely. And we also, here's our step-by-step -step practice just to give you uh, an example of what kinds of activities students can see behind the scenes here. Uh, this is one of our, another one of our natural news article examples, which I showed you uh, just a little bit earlier. Okay, um, I've told you a lot of information. I told you a lot about these programs and these resources. You might wanna know, are, do these work? Right? Are, these, do, are these actually effective? And we wanted to know the same thing. So what we did is after developing our materials, we ran a study over the 2020-2021 school year to measure the impact of the Control F program, as well as to get a better understanding of what skills students have now. So we wanted to establish a baseline, right? How good are they before any instruction of identifying good and bad sources online? We had more than 2,000 students from all across the country uh, complete assign assessments before and after going through the program. Uh, we had these, these tests asked students to evaluate different sources and claims to assign a trustworthiness score and then to explain their answers. And then we coded these answers according to the strategies that they used. So uh, we found a number of really interesting results. I'm a bad news first kind of guy. I like to get it out of the way, but here is our bad news. The baseline results show that Canadian students struggle uh, on the pretest. So before going through any sort of official sort of instruction, they relied heavily on those vertical reading strategies that I mentioned, right? So this, again, includes looking at a website's appearance, checking if the information itself is what they think is relevant, notice, noticing superficial authority signals like whether there's contact information or testing information against personal instinct to see if it sounds right, right? This is a thing that a lot of students did. They use that instinctual thing. And I, I sort of tricked you into doing that earlier with the KFC examples, right? You use your instincts to decide whether this was real or not. We found that in the pretest, 79% of students read vertically uh, and that these strategies consistently led them astray, that only 6% of students were able to identify the agenda behind an advocacy group. I'm actually gonna tell you about that in a minute here. Okay, the good news uh, is that the Control F instruction really does seem to have a significant impact. So after going through instruction, we saw a really big impact on the percentage of use of lateral reading skills as opposed to those vertical reading. So on the pretest, some students still did use some lateral reading skills, but only 11% of them did. After going through Control F, that jumped up to almost 60%. So that's a huge increase there. We also saw a really big increase in what we call reasoning. So uh, this is sort of, uh, we measured this by seeing whether students provided uh, relevant contextual information when deciding whether they thought a source was reliable or unreliable. So bad reasoning or not very good reasoning is things like, this seems right, right? That's not very good reasoning. But if you're looking at things like, well, I did some research, I found that this was a good source, or I saw that other people were reporting it, that's better Better kinds of reasoning, that's the reasoning we want. And we saw that kind of reasoning jumped from 9%, not very good, to 50%, which is a really great result as well. I'll give you an example of some of the cases that students were asked to evaluate in these studies. So here is one of our examples. Uh, it's a case from uh, the Heartland Institute. 
so question, for, this, for this question, students were asked to determine how trustworthy they found this institute as a source about climate change and the environment, and how did they decide whether this was a trustworthy source or not. So uh, by all appearances, even just from this little screenshot here, this looks professional, right? It's not covered in ads. It's not, nothing is misspelled, right? It sort of looks like a nice layout uh, of, a, of a professional looking website, right? Um, the Heartland Institute is actually a think tank and lobby group that's one of the world's leading promoters of climate change denial, right? So this is an agenda group. This is demonstrably not the place where you want to get information about climate change. It's not trying to inform you. It just it is just trying to push a certain kind of agenda. So how did students do when they were evaluating this source? Well, here is a very common answer from a student who used vertical reading strategies. So when they just stayed on the page and evaluated it there. Now, of course, we didn't ask them to do this. This is just what they did naturally. But these are the kind of strategies that they used. And here's what they said. They gave it a five out of five trustworthiness rating. And they said the following. The website looks very professional and provides deep information about climate change and the effects it is causing. It's also a .org, which means it's an organization. So it is trustworthy. OK. So a lot going on there. Five out of five trustworthiness. That's not the most important thing, right? We probably wouldn't want to give it that score. But what's more important is this reasoning, right? We can see that the student relied heavily on superficial elements of the site itself um, and things like looking very professional, right? Looking very professional is not a good indicator of a source's reliability. Anyone can make a professional looking website in minutes. That's what I always hear on my podcast advertisements from Squarespace or whatever else, right? This is not hard to do in this day and age. Uh, it's also a .org, which means it's an organization. We still hear this today. This is a common myth that does that refuses to die on the internet, that if something is a .org, it's more reliable or trustworthy than it's a .com, as if there is sort of a governing body that determines .org's good, .com's everything else. This is just not the case. .org's just say it's an organization, but you can go register a .org right now if you want to. That means nothing about the reliability. But you can see here that these sort of superficial elements can really lead students astray. Now, here is a response from a student who did the same thing, evaluated the source, but used lateral reading skills. They gave it a very different trustworthiness rating, as you can see, one out of five. And the, uh, the reasoning seems to be a lot better. They say the Wikipedia page on the Heartland Institute says it's a leading promoter in climate change denial and rejects scientific evidence on the topic. It's also worked with the tobacco company to discredit the health risks of secondhand smoke and to lobby against smoking bans. Okay, so here again, trustworthiness rating, probably more accurate, but not the most important thing. The most important thing here is the reasoning, right? This is way better. The student got off the page, they learned some context about the site, uh, and they were able to determine that this is maybe not the kind of website that you want to look for, for information about climate change. And this is exactly what we're looking for, what we want students to do with the Control F program. Okay. I hope I've convinced you that this is now a good thing, but I am, of course, happy to answer any kind of questions that you have in the chat. Again, here's just the website right here, just to let you know. Um, how to register, real easy, go to controlf.ca. Registration will just take a minute. Again, it's, everything is free. Uh, you can do it in both English and in French. Just a nice little register button up there. Uh, once you get in there, this is what you'll see. You'll see that the resources uh, are listed on your right here. They'll be broken down by lesson. All lesson plans are available in PDF for download. Uh, and these little accordion menus here that you can pop out. Uh, they take you to the videos to slide decks that are available both in PowerPoint and Google Slides, as well as to some other documents that we have here uh, that are all available in Google Forms and Microsoft Forms. We also have uh, pre and post assessments as well. So if you want to do a little study of your own with your students to see uh, what are their baseline skills, how good are they right now, and how good are they after they go through the program, that's something that you can certainly do. And we also have a suggestion here for a culminating activity, which is a verification handbook. Uh, so this is where we have students or teachers can have students uh, put together sort of a, uh, everything they've learned about lateral reading, about verifying information online. Uh, we often have teachers will send us pictures of the handbooks that their students have made. 
uh, which we always like to see. I always encourage you to send me pictures of fun things your, your uh, students are doing. Um, OK, that is all I have for you today. Um, I'm ending a little bit early. I've got 10 minutes left in the Q&A. So I'm happy to stick around for Q&A period. If you do have questions, if you do want to uh, uh, ask me any questions, you can pop that in the Q&A. You can also just pop that in the chat if you'd like. I'm just happy to look, look here at the chat. I see a few of you uh, have been participating in there, which is great. Uh, again, that website is controlf.ca. That's my email address as well. If you want to contact me, have any other questions or any problems registering or anything like that, feel free to send me an email there. And I'm happy to take any questions uh, that you might have. So just pop those in the chat or the Q&A, uh, and I'll be happy to chat with you. Thanks, Marianne says that's uh, definitely using this grade 12 world issues in grade nine geography course. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's so great um, being here with with geography, with teachers who teach geography. Usually uh, a lot of our audience are English teachers, social science uh, studies teachers. Um, it's nice to connect with the geographers because I think there is just so uh, much importance, importance in learning these kinds of skills in that geography context as well, right? I was talking about, about those earlier problems of so much so much disinformation and misinformation is is still about climate change especially with when new sort of extreme weather events occurs then there's always some sort of new sort of conspiracy theory or misinformation that's that's out there students read this stuff right uh sometimes it's silly sometimes you get whales eating kayakers but sometimes it's really important right you don't want uh you don't want that uh that false information to sort of you know affect their beliefs and their judgments about these things. So I think like in this context of geography, I think this stuff is, is really important. And it's great that uh, it's great that that uh, you all have been here today. And so many research assignments they have to do and research has somehow shifted to social media. Oh my goodness, absolutely, right? So I mean, this is this is another huge part of the problem is uh, with these sort of research assignments, if you get them to, and I, I really appreciate the comments, uh, comment Marianne. Um, uh, yeah, you get to send students away to do research about about something about in a geography class, maybe about climate, about maybe so sort of whatever else. Uh, they do this research independently, and they're just they don't have the right skills to evaluate whether this stuff is really reliable or not. And that social media aspect as well, you see they. They, we've heard from, uh, or I've heard from many of our teachers that students, they come in and they say, you know, I heard this on TikTok, you know, like, uh, is this is this right? I mean, there's been some uh, some concerns recently with some sort of viral TikTok influencers spreading misinformation or, uh, you know, and they, they come in and they just, they don't know how to determine whether that stuff is something they should believe. It seems authoritative. It's on TikTok. It has millions of views or likes or whatever metric they use on TikTok. Uh, and that's just so, it's just hard for them. They just don't have these skills. Uh, they don't have these skills sort of without being taught them. And that's just, you know, something that we really want to provide. Um, Stephanie says, uh, trying to register, uh, don't see a private option in the drop down. That is got to be a glitch. Thank you for bringing that to my attention, Stephanie. Uh, I will just check with uh, my IT people and make sure that you can. Uh, register with the school that you have. Uh, always uh, working online is always always an adventure. Sometimes a few glitches here and there. Stephanie, if you do want to send me an email as well, you can send my you can email my uh, address that is just up on there. If you want to follow up, I'll make sure that you get registered correctly and that we get you in the system there. Uh, great, Brent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. More good stuff from Civic. Seems like you know us. Um, which is awesome. I'm really happy, always happy to have you when people are using our programs. Like I mentioned, if, you, uh, if you've heard of civics before, you might know our student vote. Maybe student vote has been in your school as well. Uh, we, this is our control F is, as I mentioned, sort of our, our somewhat newish program. We actually are developing even more programs right now. So do stay tuned to civics. We've got some more stuff that's coming out uh, that's coming out real soon. Uh, thank you, Kimberly, and thank you, Stephanie. Uh, thank you as well.
Uh, okay, so if there's, uh, oh, uh, Brent was able to register for control app under the category of other, that could be certainly a thing that you could do uh, as well, Stephanie, if you'd like, but of course, uh, you can definitely still send me an email. We can sort of figure figure that out if that's uh, if that's something else that we want to want to take a look at. Okay, great. So uh, I think that we've probably had all our questions. Again, if you do have more questions, do feel free to email me there. Happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, but for now, I'm going to thank you all for joining me today. Really appreciate you doing some lateral reading with me, answering some polls and poppins and stuff in the chat. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your time here at the Kangeo conference. Thank you so much. <laughs>